Good evening, everybody, and yes, please subscribe so you get more dynamite shows like we're about to bring in. My name is Scott Morgan Roth. Welcome to Inside the Pigskin, the Motor City Madmouth. It's pretty much with this Motor City type crew, and the name of the show is a hidden gem at QB, and that hidden gem is Corey Curtis, fresh from Cape Coral, Florida. And welcome to the show, Corey. We're glad to have you tonight. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And my regulars here. We have Mel Farr Jr. Mel, welcome back. Hey, it's great to be back. Hello, everyone. And last but not least, we have George Icorn. I'm ready for some Monday Night Football, Scott and Mel. Yeah, <laughs> we have it, too. Thank you. That was, that was good. All right, well, that Monday Night Football is, like I say, a hidden gem at QB, Corey Curtis. If you haven't heard him, <clears throat> by the end of this show tonight, you definitely will have had an opportunity to hear about him. Let me give you a little bit of information about Corey, obviously, he's gone to a few different schools. And why don't you just give everybody an overview of the schools and I'll get into the numbers, Corey, as we the show proceeds. Okay. Uh, I went to Ohio State out of high school. Um, I originally from Florida. I went to Island Coast High School. I uh, went to Ohio State. Um, and then I was there for two and a half years. Uh, went to – for my COVID year, I went to Bryant, uh, finished my uh, second degree, and then I was grad transferring. <clears throat> and they didn't have my master's program, so I transferred again, and uh, and that's where I ended up at. Very good. So let me give everybody an overview here. I know your when your your first coach was actually Wayne Blair, who's with the Detroit Lions. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Tell me a little bit about what you learned from Wayne Blair. Uh, he 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 brought me uh, uh, definitely some discipline, uh, and just uh, told me that I was on the right path, working hard and trying to outwork everybody and everything like that. Okay. And then your second coach was a guy by the name of John Shochow. And you started at the end of the year. Give me an overview of coach John. Uh, yeah. Coach, Sho coach Woko. Uh, he was more of like an offensive guy. Uh, coach Blair was a defensive guy. He, um, played defense at Tulane. And then uh, coach Woko, he was an offensive mind. Um, and he's like somebody from our town that's known to, uh, to be good on offense. And he's like somebody that uh, definitely learned uh, to push the ball down the field and to be able to use my arm strength to my, to my advantage. So let's talk about the influence of both of those coaches on your career. I know obviously you went five years in college and you didn't take go with your, uh, obviously you had one year of eligibility left, but let's talk about the influences of those individuals. Uh, yeah. Those guys just told me to just continue to be myself. Uh, don't change myself for nobody. Um, I'm the type of guy that's going to fit in with pretty much anybody that I'm around. So I think that uh, they just told me not to try to get too high or too low in any situation. Uh, and I think that helped me throughout my college career. Okay. Now you talk about going to the fact that you went to Ohio State your first two years. You had Ocho Urban Meyer for a couple of years, Ryan Day. What was that experience like? Well, it was a good experience. Uh, definitely was with Coach Meyer. Uh uh, he said I reminded him of Tim Tebow, so that's kind of like my style of play, um, except uh, I think I throw the ball a little bit better than he did. Um, and then uh, – so that was good to be behind him, and he just taught me basically like the core fundamentals and uh, values of like how to be a leader and um, basically talked about like E plus R equals O all the time and how for every event you get, you have a response and how you respond determines your outcome. And then Coach Day was the offensive mind who eventually became my head coach, and he like just taught me football, every intricacy of it. And so did coach Dennis. Uh, and so then that helped me here again, because basically it's the same offense that we ran there at Ohio state. Very good. Now, and you talk about the fact that you had the opportunity to go to the cotton bowl and the Rose bowl. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, good. What was, what was that experience like being at two premium bowls that have incredible histories? Yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, definitely a good experience. Uh, I was able to help the defense uh, imitated Sam Darnold's, uh, in the Rose Bowl. Um, and then, so that was pretty cool to be able to run their offense and be able to do all that. And then the Cotton Bowl, uh, I wasn't a scout team guy anymore. So uh, I kind of just practiced, got some reps. It was just, I was the backup punter. So I did punting and all that type of stuff. Really? You were a backup punter? Yes. That's how I traveled as a freshman. 
Those no kidding. Well, I'm going to get into that. You brought on an interesting point. Well, let me tell you this real quick. Many years ago, I covered the Miami Dolphins, and they got a, brought a guy in in the last round by the name of uh, Jim Jensen, and they had two quarterbacks in that draft. And Jensen made it because he was able to play a lot more positions, and that's interesting. So you have a punter as well as a quarterback. So, all right, let's go to Bryant University. I get, I thought of Rhode Island in 20, an FCS, FCS school. 2020. So you, I guess you had, you, you know, you played two games, uh, 400 and what? <clears throat> 35 yards. You know, t- talk about that whole situation in a four game season. Yeah. So uh, I transferred in there a little bit late. I had to learn the offense. Uh, so I played the last two games. They're pretty good. Played against Brown, uh, broke the school record in passing yards and touchdowns in the game. Um, and then uh, the next game, I did pretty well. Uh, Threw for 10 yards less, uh, and we won both games. So go over some of your stats over at Bryant. I uh, threw for 414 and five touchdowns in the first game, and the second game I threw for 396 and I think three touchdowns and had two rushing. Okay. Now your next experience is Gannon University, Erie, Pennsylvania, Division II school. And you told me that you had better than – Better talent than talent wise over there. Go over that a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. I think the PSAC was a lot better than the the schools that we played uh, against in the NEC. Um, the talent here was was I, I thought a lot better of who we played against. Um, uh, just the scheme, like schematically, uh, was definitely different. Um, but it was more physical and it's more of the style of football that I'm used to playing. So I definitely enjoyed it. So what was interesting about what we talked about is that that experience was pretty good for you because you said that the record improved every year. Is that correct? We're yeah, we're two and nine, five and six, and eight and three. Uh, yes, sir. So when I got here, the they were uh, two and nine and five and six, and then uh, the next year we were eight and three. Uh, I wasn't here for the two and nine, uh, but we were here for the five and six, and then the eight and three. So at least there was uh, there was improvement, and you say it was beneficial for you because you're able to call every play from the line of script scrimmage, which I think is pretty impressive. Tell tell me what that was like, knowing that you had an opportunity to do something that most quarterbacks would not be allowed to do at a much higher level. Uh, definitely, uh, it was exciting. Uh, something um, that I think will help me at the next level. Uh, definitely had to study a lot of film, know what know what was coming, tendencies of the coaches, everything like that. Uh, and I was thankful that my head coach here. Uh, trusted me uh, enough to be able to come to the line, just basically give me a formation, checking out of things, move people around. Um, and so that I think that will help me for sure at the next level, like I said. So talk about your biggest accomplishment over there. Uh, I think just changing the culture of a program here. I think – I didn't do it myself, but uh, I think helping change it uh, definitely was a huge accomplishment. Um, trying to get that, like, not the loser, not losing mentality, but definitely a mentality of, like, complacement. Like complacency, uh, I think that was huge. Um, and then just producing on the field, um, I think was awesome as well. Now you say that, you, you know, you always feel it's important to leave it better than you found it. Is that correct? And yes, that sir. you were able to, you trusted your decision maker over there and the change of the program culture. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So we'll go over some of your stats there a little bit. Your first year, you were at 63%, 2,255 yards, 20 TDs against seven INTs, 20, 22, 57%. Your yardage went up to 2879 with 27 touchdowns and four interceptions. Boy, that is marked improvement. Yes, sir. Well, what do you attribute that to? Just maturity, uh, more playing time, uh, just getting more comfortable underneath the – uh, the head coach and calling my own stuff and being able to check it in and out of things. I think uh, definitely just bringing my completion percentage up, the yardage. And I attribute to the guys around me too. Our O-line got better. The receivers were good. Our defense put us in good situations. Um, so I think that it was just a great experience this second year, this last year, for sure. Well, we're getting a little activity in the chat room. Want to say hello to Joshua Bernstein. Thanks a lot for being on. And Blake Lozinski, what's going on? What's going on is us, my friend. So thanks a lot. Joshua and Blake for being a part of it. Also, we'll talk about your total career high school and college. 58%, 15,980, 120 touchdowns versus what? 23 interceptions. Can you believe those numbers? Those are unbelievable, George and Mel. Yes, but, they are. Quite impressive, Corey, in your high school days. Thank you. 
Yeah, that was pretty good. So what would you say that your biggest accomplishment is overall to, to date? It's a little tight. Um, beating number eight team in the country at D2, uh, that was a pretty big accomplishment, I think. Uh, and then uh, we beat them, uh, had six touchdowns in that game. Um, and then also just being able to talk about Jesus to people, I think just it's given me the platform to be able to do that, and I think that's a huge accomplishment too. You know, I think that when pro teams, Mel, and you could probably vouch for this because you played it, but let's talk about Corey's GPA, 3.8, grade point average, 3.4 with a master's. So intelligence certainly seems to be one of your stronger attributes. Mel, how important is a grade point average for a guy like Corey as he tries to take his talent to the next level? Well, you know, for him, you know, and for any player, I mean, I know sometimes football players get labeled as being dumb jocks, but yeah, at, at that position, you know, football players in general, but in particular at that position, you have to be very, very bright because a lot of information that you have to process in a short period of time. And that's what you're going to have to, uh, what you're going to have to deal with at the next level is being able to process information in a short period of time and, and try to know where you're going to go with the football before the snap. Uh, and the, the way you'll know that is by looking at the defense and you know determining what that defense is going to do. Going to do now, you know they're going to show you one look pre-snap and then the, and then jump into another look at the at the snap of the ball. But you have to be able to process that information and know that if you know this happens, this is where I'm going to go with the football. If that happens, this is where I'm going to go to football. You know, you got to know your reads. You got to know your progressions. Uh, that's one thing that you have to you know that you have to you know that that, that requires. Uh, some intelligence to be able to do that. Uh, to, number one, you got to know what everybody does on the play. You know, you got to know what, what all your offensive linemen are doing. And if something you see something differently, you got to change the blocking scheme. Uh, you got to know what all the receivers are doing, and you have to know what uh, what the defense is going to do. So, you know, it's very important. It's a lot of information that you have to process in what is it, 24 seconds in a very very short period of time. So that you know, one thing that I prided myself on is being able to know what everybody did. On the, on the offensive side of the ball. I mean, I knew exactly where the ball was supposed to go. I knew where the quarterback's go, supposed to go to the ball. I knew what the blocking was going to be. You know, if you know as a running back, if you know what the blocking, you know the blocking schemes, you know the defense, you know the gap control, then you know the lanes are going to be, and you can be, and you can take advantage of, the, of all that stuff. But also for me, you know, being a guy that was more on the bottom of the roster, the more you know, the more you can do, the more opportunities you're going to make for yourself. So I mean, I also played, you know, backup tight end, H back, you know. The, if a receiver was down in practice, I go jump out there at wide receiver and run the route so we can keep practice going because I knew I knew exactly what we we're supposed to do. I knew exactly what was supposed to be done on the play. Um, so you know, the more you can do, and I just heard you say you can punt. You know, don't 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 be ashamed to get out there and and, and show off your foot a little bit. I mean, there's been a couple guys in the league who have you know, been backup quarterbacks, but also have been punters. I mean, Randall Cunningham was a punter. Um, uh, Danny White, you know, he started out as a punter down there, down there at the Cowboys. So uh, Pittsburgh, Malone, I believe, was a punter, if I'm not mistaken. Was that his name, Malone? Can't, I can't remember, but there's been there's been Mark a few Malone, guys. I think you're right. It might have been Mark Malone. Yeah, Mark Malone, I believe he was a punter. So, I mean, you know, there's been a few guys who've made had an opportunity to make a team because they could do something else. So, you know, don't be afraid to get out there and show off your leg a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I should point out that Corey is six foot four, two hundred and thirty-six pounds. So when you talk, uh, when you talk about the fact that you didn't go to the combine, but you did go to pro days, but but I'll, I'll get to that in a moment because I think it's important to let everybody know who your idols are as well. You say your idols are Joe Burrow and Pat Mahomes. Is that right? That you would lo love to sit behind those guys. Yes, those would be great guys to learn behind. I was already behind Joe before. You got a couple of winners right there, man. For sure. All right, oh I should God. point out, everybody, that the audio version of Inside the Pigskin can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please hit the red subscribe button on YouTube, South Florida Tribune, okay? We're striving for a 1,000 subscribers. Also... Please comment, like, and share the broadcast. Want to be a guest? No problem. Send topic ideas to South Florida Tribune at gmail.com. And if you want to advertise, no problem. Call me at 954 304 4941. 
We are live on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, as well as YouTube. All right, so we talked about Mahomes that you'd like to sit behind. You say that you play like Ben Roethlisberger? Um, that's what I've been told. Uh, but definitely, like, de- definitely welcome to contact. Um, I'm going to break tackles. I'm going to be one of the stronger people, the stronger quarterbacks that you probably have seen. Um, and I pride myself on that. Okay, now you're obviously you're not alone with this one. But you said your favorite quarterback of all time is Peyton Manning. Definitely. Definitely. I, I, I always like strive to be cerebral like him, definitely with the, at the quarterback position. Um, so, uh, and that's something I think that this offense has helped me uh, even get better at in my decision making, processing everything, making sure, checking the safeties, all that type of stuff, uh, and just being able to process things fast. Okay. So let's talk about how you manage to get a pro day. Let's face the reality. You come from a division two school. You sent a guy by the name of Mike Butler and Duquesne arrange the whole thing. Please elaborate. Uh, so I was at the FCS bowl, uh, in Daytona beach, Florida. Um, and, and I played there and Mike Butler, he's the, he's a scout for the Steelers. Uh, he, he like, was, Hey, Hey, are you going to go to any all-star game? Like, uh, and I was like, uh, yes, sir. Um, I was like, I got invited to the tropical cannibal, uh, and I got invited to the CGS game. Um, and then, so I went to the CGS game uh, and I, I did, I went there and I did well. I threw four touchdowns, um, against some, uh, division one competition. Uh, so I did pretty well there. Got to work under center, which is something that a couple teams said that they want to see me do. And he asked me, he's like, where are you going to your pro day? And I was like, well, I've been trying to get into a pro day, but like everybody has like their quarterback or they're having their junior quarterback, junior quarterback throw and stuff like that. And he was like, well, let me make a couple calls. And about two weeks later, um, he, he's like, Hey, I got you into the Duquesne uh, pro day. So it's just, I'm, so then he was like, yeah, I put my name in there. I, I put my name in there and said, yeah, I was going. And so then I went to the Duquesne pro day. Okay. Now you say four teams worked you out afterwards, the Texans, the Dolphins, the Steelers, and the Colts. What was that experience like working out for, for those guys? It was good. Um, so the first session, the first 20 minutes of the pro day went very good. I missed one throw, uh, that I was able to throw again uh, when they worked me out. I mean, I rolled out to the right and threw a comeback. Threw a little bit too high. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, the workouts went good. Uh, just basically just working on things that they thought that I need to work on. Um, mostly um, moving on the run, throwing on the run and everything like that. And th- they uh, they said for my tape, my platform has gotten skinnier and stuff like that. So that that's something that they are glad that uh, they thought that was a knock on me because it made my delivery a little bit long. But now that I've shortened it up, uh, they were definitely interested. And I threw the ball 84 yards. Uh, and that's when, after that, like everybody was, like asked me to work out after and stuff like that. So it was exciting. Well, amazingly enough, the Dolphins have an issue at quarterback with two attack of a low and his concussion issue. So I guess it's probably no surprise that they might be looking for insurance somewhere along the lines. And they're not afraid to reach out for prospects, as we found out with Skylar Thompson. Did any of these teams talk to you afterwards and interview you? And what what did you get out of each and every one of the teams that did speak to you on a more direct level? Uh, yeah, uh, basically I just got like my draft grades and everything like that from them. Uh, definitely I've been in contact with them since. Um, more of like getting to know me, uh, getting to know my family, uh, getting to know like what type of person I am off the field. Uh, and then uh, they talked to me about like the things I can improve on, uh, which is like my platform. And then, uh, once they asked me to send videos of everything and uh, I've been doing that. And so then everything's just been going good. Just getting to know, getting to know them basically. And just staying in touch. So you say at that pro day, 11 teams were in attendance. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So, so what was it like to have 11 teams there, even though you formally spoke to four of them? Uh, it was a good experience. I'm just thankful that I got to throw in front of people. I think that's something that um, I feel like may, maybe not a lot of people know my name or any at all, but once they see me throw in person, it's something that I definitely catch their eye. Uh, I don't think there's a quarterback with a stronger arm. I am humbly say that in the draft. Uh, and I, I pride myself on accuracy and uh, just being able to be personable and everything like that. And I, I think once they get to talk to me and uh, see me throw, I think uh, they start to love me. Well, amazingly enough, when you tell me that, okay, and, and I look at the fact that you didn't have the combine to work with, does that bother you that you never were at the combine? Because I know George and I can joke around about 
Dan Campbell and Mel's even mentioned it, that the combine, all it is was basically, what, shirts and a T-shirt anyway, so it's really not a whole lot. Do you feel like you missed out on much, or do you think the pro days were far better and more beneficial than what the combine could have been like? I, I mean, obviously, everybody wants to go to the combine. It's like what everybody looks forward to. But I've also had friends from my hometown that's gone to the combine and not got drafted. Uh, so, uh, and like Sammy Watkins, from, he was from my hometown. He, he got invited, but he didn't go. Uh, so... Um, and he just produced at his pro day, and he ended up having to uh, get drafted and everything like that. So uh, I, I liked the pro day atmosphere because definitely it was just like focused on me throwing. Uh, so uh, I, I like I appreciated that, and I just was just for the teams to be there, and give me the chance to be able to throw in front of them. And I had some great receivers. I had Dwayne Brown from IUP. He was a thousand yard receiver every year that he was in college, and then Dwayne Menders from Duquesne. That was pretty good too. So they made me look good. Okay, a few other things I want to get to, and I'm going to turn it over to George and Mel. You're a three-sport athlete, is that correct? That was, yes. And what sports did you play in? Uh, basketball and baseball. Which one did you like the best? Um, I was probably the, I'm probably the best at uh, baseball, but I was I like basketball and I love football, so it's one of those things that's tough. Okay, so now you have an opportunity to sell teams – as to why they should actually draft you this year, what would you tell them? Uh, obviously, I'm going to be going in as like as, as a, like a quarterback three practice squad guy, uh, somebody that's going to make the uh, the team um, better. I'm going to push the guys in front of me, um, but I'm also going to try to be the starter every day. I'm going to work to be the starter every single day, and I'm not going to let anybody outwork me. And I know that's a cliche, but that's something that I pride myself on. Um, I can fit in with anybody, uh, and then also like. You're not going to have any issues with me on or off the field. Um, so. Well, that's good. Okay, now. And I can play some ball. Well, there that's what they want to hear, and that's what they want to see for sure. And and with a guy like yourself where you're in everything to gain, nothing to lose situation, nobody can ever label you as a bust because, obviously, you're not as heralded as a lot of the guys that potentially could be drafted on the first night of the draft, which is on April 27th. So you talk about the small school versus big school journey to the pros. Explain to me what that experience is like for you to know that, hey, you know what, there's David and Goliath, small versus big school. Do you really relish that kind of thing? Yeah, I like it. I always root for the underdog. Um, I'm thinking I'm definitely the underdog in this scenario, but I also, like you said, I think like it's everything and nothing to lose. Um, I was there with uh, JT Barrett, Dwayne Haskins, and Joe Burrow, and um, I was just I was right there foot, side by side with them uh, every single day uh, in competitions. Uh, uh, Joe was my partner, uh, and Matt Matt drills. I competed against him every single day, um, and it was back and forth. Uh, he definitely didn't be, definitely didn't get the best of me. Uh, so that's something that um, I pride myself in because I know that I can play at the next level. I was against this, I played against the starting defense there uh, every single day. Um, so like I know I can complete a ball against Denzel Ward. I know that I can, um, I know I can break Jerome Baker's tackle, and and I know I can get out of the way of Nick Bosa. So, like I know I can do those things. I just have to be able to prove it on a, on a Sunday or in practice. Well, you know, I got to tell you, Corey, got some people in Miami that want you to come down there. Blake Lozinski, best of luck to you. I hope you get drafted to the Dolphins. And Joshua Bursing, hell yeah. So there you go. <laughs> Who knows? Many people do. You know, you're not, you're only a couple of hours away off of I 75 in Alligator Alley. So, we, you know, you talked about it on Bo Crouch's show. And now I definitely want the same comment here. You have the XFL versus the USFL. Didn't you say that you thought the XFL was a better league? Oh, uh, no. I, I thought, I think that. I like the rules in the XFL, but um, I would play in both. I don't mind. Like, obviously, I, I an opportunity to play football at a professional level is something that not a lot of people get to do, uh, and that's something that I'd be blessed to be able to do. Well, I can tell you right now, with all due respect, the USFL is at a good time because you've got 10 weeks to go, and they'll probably be done by mid-June anyways, So, and then NFL training camps start up shortly thereafter. So, all right, with that said, you know, obviously I'm going to – let George Eichhorn ask you a bunch of questions. I appreciate George and Mel allowing me to get these out. And, and Mel and George, have at it. Well, yeah, first of all, uh, I'm honored to be on here with you and, and talk about your future. A lot of times we hear about the term developmental quarterback. What do you think of that term as far as how it relates to the NFL teams? Um, 
it's just I, like it just it gives you a chip on your shoulder. Um, there's people that have been have to be developmental and they end up doing great. Brock Purdy was the developmental guy, and as, when he got his chance, he made the most of it. Uh, so it's something that I know that um, I'm not going to have a high value going in. Um, but I, by the time I leave, I want to be able to have a high value by the time I leave. Yeah, and you know, situation like Detroit, I'm surprised that, uh, and maybe they were one of the eleven there because uh, they have a situation where they've got a veteran, Jared Goff. But they don't have much depth at quarterback at all. The Lions have uh, uh, kind of gotten away with it. Not just this regime. I'm talking about previous regimes, too, as Mel and Scott knows. Uh, they have not been very good at uh, always having a capable backup quarterback. So there's a lot of rumors, like even in Detroit, you know, that they're going to draft somebody. Maybe not in the first round because they have those two first-round picks, but in one of the later rounds. Um, what about a city like Detroit? Uh, I don't. I don't mind if I get a chance to play ball. I'm gonna go play ball. That's just who I am. It doesn't matter where I am. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, is um, I used to be the announcer. Uh, we've got Division Two right here in Detroit too, Wayne State University, uh, okay. which is uh, located just a couple miles, as Mel knows, right from Ford Field in the in Detroit. And uh, I'm with you, my friend, because uh, I've seen you know players come out of that division two you know we got we got a school in michigan called ferris state university that just won a championship this year at d2 so mm -hmm. i agree with scott what he said there's a lot of potential don't give me none of that and don't use that as an excuse as i know you won't Corey. uh the d2 has a lot of good talent especially with the transfer portal like a lot of people have had to move down like slippery rocks defense all four of their secondary were drop downs from one from notre dame one was from wisconsin uh, they have a DB that's coming out. Uh, he was at Nebraska. Um, so they're definitely played, definitely played against some talent. For sure. Sure. Mel? Yeah, the one thing um, <clears throat> you have to be mindful of when you get out there, and don't, and not, not to put any pressure on you, but <clears throat> you have to understand that you have to, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to get very many opportunities to prove that you can play. Okay. Whereas a guy who is a, a high draft pick, he's going to have plenty of opportunities to prove that he cannot play. You understand the difference? Yes, sir. They're going to give him way more opportunities to prove that he was a bust versus, you know, you giving you an opportunity to prove that you deserve that opportunity. So make sure you know your stuff. That's the most important thing. Make sure you know your stuff. If you if you bust, make sure you bust full speed. Don't, you know, I, I, that's what I thought it was. You know, don't, don't never – Never bust and it's and you, you know or make a mental error. Make sure that you know your stuff and that when you come out there that you're prepared. Uh, the one thing and I know you played at Ohio State, so you know what the speed is going to be like. But the speed is going to be a lot different, obviously, than what you're playing playing against right now. <clears throat> the bodies are going to be a lot different, but you know that playing at Ohio State, you know what the bodies are going to look like. Um, and they, they, they move a lot faster. They get to you a lot quite faster. Those windows are they close quicker. You know, open is not necessarily wide open. In college, you see guys running wide open. You don't see guys running wide open in the NFL. Guy, you know, if somebody's on your back right here and you put the ball out here, that, that guy's open. They, now they got 50-50 balls. They want you to throw it up there if he's a receiver and, and they feel real good about him and his opportunities against the DB. They want you to throw it up there as a 50-50 ball and see if your guy can come down with it. Those are the type of throws that you're going to have, you know, that maybe you may or may not have done in the past that you're going to have to do going forward. So just make sure that you know your stuff when you get out there and, uh, you know, just give it everything you had, you know, give it everything that you possibly have and, um, you know, hold nothing back. Don't play scared. Um, these guys put their pants on just like you do one leg at a time. They're no different. I know you might go in there and you might be, starstruck by some of the people you see like, man, I remember watching that guy when I was in junior high school and so forth and so on. I mean, I can tell you some legends that I played <clears throat> that I played against and even some that I played with and, you know, but you can't be strong starstruck. You got to feel like you belong. That's the biggest thing is feel like you belong and, and, and you'll do it right. You know, let's let, let the chips fall where they may. You yeah. know, it's interesting how we talked about Tom Brady. How much Corey do you draw off of the fact that Tom Brady has had so much success, and yet he was what six round, what one ninety nine, I think it was. You know, so great quarterbacks can fall anywhere; they don't have to be on day one of the draft. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, like uh, like we were saying earlier, like uh, quarterback position is the hardest position to be able to like evaluate. Uh, so definitely they're going to miss, and there's going to be people that fall through the cracks, and I think that I could be one of those guys. Uh, like you said, like, yeah, like uh, it def- the speed's definitely going to be faster. You're definitely going to have bigger guys coming at you. The cl- windows are going to be shorter. Um, but it's something that I'm, I'm not going to back away from. I don't back away from uh, anything. Uh, and then I've definitely been there. Like, I mean, I've thrown to Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave and had Jeremy Rucker at tight end, been able to ha- have those guys block for me. So I'm definitely um, just excited to be out there and just – not necessarily excited. I'm I'm ready. Like I've been training for this my whole life. I'm and, and you know, ready. a point that Mel made before we were on the air is very important now with the XFL, the USFL. You got the Canadian Football League. Of course, that's already in, you know, on uh, in progress. But um, what I'm saying is that there's so many opportunities out there. And Scott uh, has talked to us about that as well on on different shows. Um, and and again, I know your focus is on NFL. It's got to be on NFL. You have to be ready for the Premier League of all. But there are a lot of opportunities out there and do not get discouraged. And like Mel was saying, you know, sometimes those, some of the best ones uh, don't get drafted and uh, are invited to camp, to different camps. And I'm sure you've thought about this already too, Corey. Yes, sir. So, Corey, so we, I, I was going to ask him a question. So what do you think is your strong suit? Like I know coming from UCLA, one thing that guys used to always – say to us or, or we felt real comfortable we we talk amongst one another is the coaching that we had at ucla that prepared us for the nfl uh because there are certain things that we had to do before we even were able to get on the field i mean if you couldn't if you didn't know the defenses that you were playing against you weren't going to be able to play on on saturday and i don't care how talented of an athlete that you were and we had some extremely talented guys but you had to be able to know exactly what you saw on first down second down and third down so the first thing the position coach is going to ask us when we come off the field is, you know, what was the defense on first down? What was the defense on second down? What was the defense on third down? If it was a three and out situation. And we had to be able to recite that. And if we couldn't recite it, you're not getting out there. And the reason being is obviously because blocking, you know, the quarterback, you know, in the blocking game, you know, uh, the passing game, you mm-hmm. got to know who you're going to pick up on, on, on pass protection. So for you, when you, when, when you're in the huddle, you get the play called, in or it's signed in however you guys get to play get to play in and when you get up to the line of scrimmage what is your thought process at that particular time so when i would just get a formation uh and i would check uh down front where we're getting over under front we got three uh okie front uh and I, so i would decide okay so do we have numbers in the box so then i go look at the safeties are, are they on level off level um and so i, I see what type of defense am i gonna think i'm gonna get expect okay it's third and long this team probably runs quarters against this maybe cover two two tampa uh and so definitely um i'm definitely a student of the game and i, I definitely think that's something that uh is a strong suit that i've been i've been half I, like i've had to do it at a, at a fast paced and uh bit level and stuff like that change people around people people in motion um uh while i'm calling everything so i think that's going to help me at the next level and then, uh, my arm strength i don't I, I definitely think that's something that's going to open some eyes and everything like that. All right, well, you know what? It's a curse because you're going to be able to think you can put it in windows, and those windows aren't going to be the same type of windows that you had when you're playing at the, at the D2 level. So be careful. Are you? Do you anticipate your throw? Are you? Are, are you? Are you? Or do you have to see it first before you throw it? No, so I definitely like, anticipate. So, like when you okay, so are and I don't know how they do it in college. And are you reading one side of the field? versus the other or you or you have a progression that you follow so we did a little bit of both uh we had full field progressions and we had uh um we had some half field reads uh so one high two highs obviously look at the safety see if they roll those are easy uh the full full field progressions uh those those are like the bread and butter uh kind of run like the chip kelly dinner bible type of stuff um with the wide cross and 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 uh the drive and everything like that so if they're a little bit covered you kind of know what with what coverage you're going to get like okay if it, they're in zone we're gonna get this. We gotta we gotta anticipate, not predetermined, but anticipate where we're going with the ball. Um, and that's something that I was very good at. Turning the ball over is an issue that like I've never had an issue with. Um, I think Mo overall I've thrown 120 touchdowns and like 20 interceptions. So I think that's something that will continue to happen because I will study and know everybody's tendencies. I'm kind of a freak about it. So we got a question out of the chat room by Joshua Bernstein. Okay. Where do you want to go? Any particular team you really love to play for? Every every quarterback or every player dreams of some place that they'd like to go. Do you have one? I think it would be cool, cool to be home back in Miami. Uh, I also think that 
Uh, the Steelers would be a good fit. Kind of a hard-nosed quarterback uh, is my playing style, and I think that the Steelers need that. And also just, like, truly uh, a place that will give me an opportunity um, is somewhere I, I, I'd love to go. I, I'm not picky. I, I'll, I could play for any team that needs me, obviously. You mentioned Roethlisberger earlier, and, boy, I'll tell you what, I've always admired that guy. I mean, you talk about, you know, the old the old uh, rust bucket cities, Detroit, Cleveland, Pittsburgh. Uh, but Ben, boy, he went to work. He was tough as nails. He played through a lot of injuries and all that. Uh, why do you identify or why did you like to identify with Ben? Uh, I'm a bigger guy, uh, I, I, a younger Ben. I can move a little <laughs> bit. Uh, I'm tough. I played on the broken fibula for the last five games of the season. Um, so I'm definitely somebody that will play through things. I'm not going to let my team down. Uh, and I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight and I'm going to fight and I'm going to win the game. All right. I want to go back to the chat room. One of Joshua, great question, Blake. We appreciate you. I hope you guys will share this show and subscribe as well so that we have more great questions like you guys have provided. You got tonight, Joshua Bernstein and Blake Lozinski, our unofficial guest in the chat room. So we call them the stars of the chat room. We're having fun on the air. These guys are behind the scenes and they're contributing mightily and greatly. Thank you so much, Josh and Blake. So, you know, I mean, that, and that's really what it's all about. I mean, I, I'm, I've always been intrigued by the Dolphins situation because they ended up bringing, who did they bring the backup quarterback from the Jets, I think, this year? Mike White? Mike White. Right. So, you know, with all due respect, <coughs> you know, you got to believe that with Tua's concussion issues, you know, they have about a year or two left, so they've got to be thinking and being proactive, which is why you ended up, if you draw between the lines, why those four teams in general worked you out. Definitely. Yeah. So um, I'm excited about it. Uh, I think that Miami would be a great fit. Uh, I like Coach McDaniel's offense uh, and got a couple friends that play on the team, so I definitely would feel comfortable going in there and uh, learning the playbook because I've seen it. Uh, so – it's something that I think I could pick up pretty easily. Corey, right, what do you think about the tendency? It's been so great the last number of years, the running quarterbacks, the rushing quarterbacks. Um, what do you what do you think about that uh, tendency that the league has kind of gone through in the last uh, half dozen or so years? I mean, there are exceptions, I know. Brady wasn't that good a runner, Aaron Rodgers, but so many of them nowadays seem to be, you know, multiple threat. Yeah. Uh, I mean, growing up in high school, we used to go watch Lamar play in high school. Uh, so that was like something that was exciting to go watch. And he, and he's a beast and he should get his money. Uh, Jalen Hurts is a guy that's that. I mean, he is his whole offense. Uh, he is the epitome of the Eagles offense. I think that if you can run, it brings a whole nother level to the offense. And I think that's awesome. And I love that. Uh, I also think that as a pocket passer, I'm not going to be putting my body on the line as much as somebody that do, does go and run. Uh, so I think that I could last longer. Um, but, like, these guys are doing it. Like, Jalen Hurts ran the ball a ton last year, and he didn't – he was pretty healthy. I mean, he hurt his shoulder, um, but he just has to learn to slide and everything like that. Um, Lamar stayed pretty healthy until he got hurt. Um, so I think these guys that can run obviously bring another aspect to the game. Um, but I also think that as a pocket passer, it doesn't hurt me. Yeah, there's no longevity to that, though. So, you know, being able to move around in the pocket is the key. Obviously, as you know, move, just moving around, moving around, sliding here, sliding there, like Tom Brady does, getting the ball out quick, and let you know, let those guys get paid to do what, what they get paid to do. They get paid to to move the football down the field, to make the make the plays, break a tackle, and so forth and so on. And your job is to get the ball to them. Your job is a is a distributor, and their job is to you know to make the plays with the ball once you get the ball to them. But you know, you have to get the ball to them. That's your that's the key. Yes, sir. And I'm like I'm like a point guard on, on the offense, so I just gotta get the ball to my playmakers. Let them do, make their plays. Like Brock Purdy this did this year, he has the dudes around him. He got the ball to them. They made their plays and they went to the Super Bowl. Yeah, you extend the play with your legs. You know, give your receivers an opportunity. I mean, they can't, can't cover guys forever. Yeah. And if you're able to extend the plays with your legs or slide around in the pocket to avoid the rush, get the ball to your playmakers. You're gonna play a lot longer uh, that way than you would uh, you know, playing the way Lamar plays and playing the way Jalen plays. And I love both players. And I'm happy for both players, particularly Jalen getting his money. Hopefully, like you said, Lamar will get his money as well. But, you know, there's a long, you know, they, they eventually they're going to have to learn how to make more plays from the pocket and just use their legs to extend plays and to move around the pocket. 
you, sure. you know, Corey, I like your analogy saying that you're the point guard of the offense. That's a really good analogy because I think a quarterback has to really go out there and think like a point guard because of the ball's in your hands. It's like the pitcher, you know, and then the catcher. And I caught that when I was a ball baseball player. But that's a great analogy. So let's move the, move things up on April 27th and the rest of those days. Where are you going to be, especially on day one, of the draft, obviously, you don't plan to get drafted in the first or second, the first day, but maybe the second or third. But what's what's your draft day going to be like on during the week and the weekend? So I'll be working out on the twenty seventh. Um, and I'll try to work out all day. Um, and then the twenty eighth, I'll be with my family uh, and my fiance. And then on the twenty ninth, uh, she has a game, and so we'll be watching the game. And then uh, by the time our game's over, we'll come home, shower, and go to B Dubs. So we'll be at B Dubs by the time. Uh, so you. So you really don't – do you plan to watch the draft very much or not? Yes, we're, we're going to watch it. Uh, so we're going to go out to eat, and then by the time we're done eating, the draft should be starting, uh, and then we'll be here. We'll Hopefully you get drafted and you won't have to watch it so much. For sure. Yeah. No. <laughs> Hopefully some team will take you out of your misery early. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. Well, hey, what, do you, what do you think, Corey, about the draft moving around? It's exciting for the fans, isn't it? Kansas City this year and, of course, my hometown – in Scott's hometown, and Mel's, Detroit, Michigan, we get it next year. Isn't that a great idea by the league to move that draft around? Yeah, I think it's cool, and it gives the fans a different experience to be able to go in uh, from different cities that might not be able to travel that far and be able to go see the, see the draft and everything like that. Um, so it's exciting. It's really come a long ways. I mean, you think back, Mel, when you were uh, you and your dad were drafted. I mean, my goodness. I mean, you know, it was just a small little affair, let's say, in New York. Uh, it was Scott and I would cover it at the Lions facility or whatever, but, oh, it's just magnificent what's happened. The explosion of talent and mock drafts, well, one, two, three, four, five versions of mock drafts. Um, America loves its football, no question about it, and obviously you do too. Yeah, the NFL's done a great job. With it. I think when I was playing, I don't think the entire draft was – was televised. Uh, I can't remember. It might have been rounds one through five or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, Mel. Because back then, you know, I think there was there was twelve rounds, twelve or thirteen rounds when I came out. That was the last. We drafted eighty eight, right? Or, or, or it was the second to last year of the 13, 12 round draft, thirteen round draft. I think it was the second to last year when when I came out. So I, I think only the first five rounds were drafted. After that, you know, you just had to wait for the phone to ring. Mm-hmm. So, so, Corey, let's talk about – well, we got to talk about Aaron Rodgers. You're glad that thing is over with with the Jets finally? That it uh, uh, Did you get sick and tired of hearing about it after a while? Uh, yeah. Uh, I knew that he was – I pretty much knew that he was going there, so it wasn't something that I even worried about. Um, I just knew that the Packers like me, and I've been talking to them, so I'm glad that one of the quarterbacks are out of that room so that I can maybe have the opportunity to go there too. Yeah, well, that's an interesting point now. Rodgers is now with the Jets. Have there has there been much discussion about you going to Green Bay at all? You're certainly not afraid of cold weather because you played up uh, on the East Coast. Uh, yeah, I uh, talked to them quite a bit. They've talked to my agent quite a bit. So just oh, really? kind of like a wait and see kind of moment. And you know and, that's a great uh, franchise. Obviously, what a great history they've had with Bart Starr and and uh, Aaron Rodgers and. I tell you what, that would be a, it'd be sure a lot different weather, like Scott said, than Southern Florida. But uh, we have a we have a great rivalry here in Detroit, obviously with the uh, Packers, the Bears, and the Vikings. All right, so our focus has been on football, but let's just say hypothetically the football thing doesn't work out. Although I know you have many more opportunities than most people have in the past. Have you thought about what life? what life would be like after football and what do you want to get into? Uh, I'd probably want to go be a PA or uh, go into like genetic counseling. Hmm. Interesting. Would you consider any other sports as we, we, we have seen multiple athletes have, uh, have you know, left one sport and gone to the other one. If you're so, uh, so inclined. Uh, I could probably do a ba- I could probably be a PO in baseball, uh, but I haven't thrown a, I haven't pitched in, five years so i don't know how good i'd be at it or any, anything like that anymore so yeah. it definitely had to be something i'd work at um i could definitely throw hard enough i was throwing mid-90s in high school so could you really wow mm-hmm. anything you got george and mel you want to add Corey? no sir well i i just want to tell you that uh, what mel said to you earlier i mean just uh have a lot of confidence and there's a lot of teams out there with a lot of needs and uh 
you know, the depth chart on quarterback is, is a short one. We all know that. But, uh, you know, teams definitely need to look at a lot of candidates. And there's so many teams out there, as you know, that are that are looking for quarterbacks. And, and also the USFL, XFL, CFL, and leagues like that as well. Well, it's funny. You talk about the CFL. I'm sorry, Mel. No, go ahead. But it's a much different style of ball with three downs. Can you ever imagine what it would be like for you, Corey, to play in the Canadian Football League? Let's not kid yourself. Doug Flutie and Warren Moon have played. I mean, it's it's a wider field, a longer field. But tell me what it would be like for Corey Curtis in the Canadian Football League. So I've talked to I've I've definitely been talking to some CFL teams and told them that like we're just going to wait until after the uh, draft and everything like that. Uh, I think that would benefit me uh, for my arm strength and everything like that. Um, so I, I think the CFL would be a good experience. Um, but like any experience play football, like I'm, I'm down for But that's a different animal. You got, uh, the end zone there is probably the infield of a baseball field. I'm just kidding with you. It's definitely but beneficial it, for the quarterback at that. The CFL is, it's like seven yeah. on seven out there. It's, it's a huge field and you should go out there and sling the rock. Yeah. I've well, I guess. That forward. Yeah, Canada talks about it being far and wide, but you know, with all due respect, the field is far and wide too. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, it's just George brought up an interesting point, and you know, before you had the XFL, the USFL, a lot of players were looking to go to the CFL if they could to fine tune their game, and now you have obviously you're in a fortunate position that you have more leagues to work with. So, uh, I just thought it, George brought up an interesting point. Go ahead, Mel. I, before I cut you off, I had to get the CFL thing out there. Go ahead. No, that's all right. And I think it's good. Like I said before, we, before we got on air, that I think it's good that they have these developmental leagues. I think it's going to improve the play, especially at that position, the most important position. You look at some of these teams that have had that had trouble at the, that had trouble at that position, and what they had to what they had as a backup, and these guys don't get any have any live reps. You know, the, the play just goes you know goes down, and then you have some guys who are journeymen who just go from team to team to team as a backup quarterback. And, they, and, you know, even though they've gotten some live reps in the NFL competition, they just aren't very, very good. So having that opportunity to get those live reps is critical if in the event things don't work out in the NFL. Now, it's funny you had mentioned that, you know, baseball was your better sport. My dad always thought baseball was my better sport too. But here, do the math. I'm going to tell you to do the math. That's what you have to do. When you go to camp and you're a smart guy, you do the math. I think they have 90 guys. I think they can sign 90 guys, 90 guys, have 90 guys who are running around during the uh, spring and stuff like that in the summer. I think they only take 80 guys to camp. Is that correct? I think it's 80 guys, or do they up at the 90? I can't remember. I think it used to be at 80 at one time. 90 from what the last I've heard. So they take 90 guys to camp. So it's a 53 man roster now, plus plus they have 10, 10 guys in the practice squad, right? So that's 63 guys are gonna make the team, right? Right. Yes. So that means they're gonna cut what 27 folks? Yes. Yep. Like that. Okay. So it's twenty-seven folks. So there's how many people in the quarterback room? You know, they, they some, three teams, now. some teams some teams carry three, some teams carry two. You know, some teams carry three. They keep one inactive. They they dress two. They're gonna have a guy on the practice squad because they want they want an arm on the practice squad. So you you don't need to worry about being the starter. You have to be a worried about you. Have, your job is to get the last guy's job. That's what you're doing. Whoever's number three or number two, that's who you have to eye. And that's who you that's who you're competing against is that guy. The starter's job is the starter's job. Now he goes down, he gets hurt. Guess what? You got to be ready because get, all of a sudden you're the starter now, or you're the you're the backup. And you're one play away. You're you're one play away from getting in there. So you got to be ready. So sure. the key is look at the numbers. Look at the numbers in the room when you when you're making your decision. If you don't get drafted, look at those numbers. See what those numbers look like, and see where. And also, you know where your style of football, your style of play would, would be, you know would be showcased the best. What offense? What offensive scheme? Uh, what type of? Uh, you know, how, how is the? How, how is the franchise? The stability of the franchise? All those kind of things may may come into play. I mean, you may want to go to a place that then stand, the franchise isn't all that stable, that doesn't really have a quarterback, or you want to go somewhere who has an established quarterback where you can learn from. So look at all those things, but understand the numbers and understand what your job is and what it is you're trying to do. You're just trying to get that last guy's job. That's what you're, that's what you're concerned about. Don't worry about trying to get be the starter coming out of camp. Just worry about that last guy. Just look at the numbers, play the numbers in your favor, and I think you know, you're going to have a great shot because, you know, you look good getting off the bus. I mean, you, you look you look the part. 
that's key. You look the part. Now mm -hmm. you got to play the part. Sure. I, should, I should point out once again, the audio version of Inside the Pigskin can be heard on iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, please hit the red subscribe button on YouTube, South Florida Tribune. We're striving for 1,000 subscribers. That's our first goal. Please also comment, like, and share the show broadcast. Want, want to be a guest? No problem. Send your topic ideas to South Florida Tribune at gmail.com or you can send them through me on Twitter at Tribune South. If you want to advertise, you know, feel free to give me a call back at 954 304 4941. We are live on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. So my Twitter handle is at Tribune South and that you can get us your ideas, questions for Corey, and then uh, any questions you have for Corey, I'll definitely convey them as well. So, any closing thoughts before we go into we wrap this thing up, George? George no, Corey? it's an exciting time. It's an exciting week, and uh, Corey, we want to wish you the best of luck. And uh, there's just a uh, you know, stay positive, like I know you are. Uh, keep those reps going. Uh, you know, practice, work out as much as you can, and uh, and and good things will happen. Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mel, anything you want to add, Corey? Make sure you know the words to your fight song. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that is funny. That's well, a good one, Mel. Oh, well, Mel always uh, throws a good one in, and he just live in the part like he's telling Corey to live the Bible sketch. You know, it's not worthy of knocking my hand off, but it was definitely a time to comment. So with that said, whether well, you know it or not, Corey, we have an author on the show. So, George, why don't you let everybody know how they can get a hold of you and talk I've about been, your book. I've been around so long, Corey, that I wrote the book about Detroit sports broadcasters. And oh, I can man. remember I can remember when Mel Farr's dad put a cape on and he flew in the air in Detroit. And you think that's I'm making up. I'm not. Uh, Mel's the wonderful father. His late dad was a great salesman, a good car man. He loved the Ford Motor Company and, uh, and did a great job, of course, uh, uh, as a Detroit Lion. But my book, Detroit Sports Broadcasters on the Air, is available. There's a link to it on the South Florida Tribune website. I write for Scott under the Motor City Tribune banner and locally uh, the Downtown Monitor. And I also can be reached at gicorn at yahoo.com. Scott's in the book, too. I can't forget because Scott interviewed two great guys. Wow. Jimmy Connors and Muhammad Ali. It doesn't get a lot better than that. Uh, I'm telling you, we've got some great, uh, great photos in that book. So uh, uh, but it's been great to be on the show tonight. You can also reach me on Twitter at SanGSports99. Beautiful. All right, Mel, what about you? Uh, let everybody know how they can get a hold of you. Get a hold of me on all the social media at Mel Farr Jr., Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and the other one, Instagram. And find out what we have going on here in Georgia and also up in Detroit. For the uh, for the youth at melfar.org. Okay, I should also point out other information that you can go to our website www.southfloridatribune.com. Candy Ebling does a great job putting up putting the shows on as well as the continuous content. We definitely are thankful that she's a really big participant. And she wishes you luck as well, Corey. So you have a lot of fans here on this. I should also point out that Corey has done a really good job on this show. So he's going to be a friend of the show talking football, and we will be bringing him back in probably in about a week or two to find out where the guy lands, and he'll always be able to provide his insight and knowledge anytime he wants to come on our network under the different types of shows that we have to offer. Corey, uh, with the assistance of Bo Crouch, who goes by football with Bo on Twitter, you know, it was a great opportunity to send you questions and then talk to you afterwards. And I'm glad that we had an opportunity to bring you on our show as well. And the next time you come on, you'll have George and I, and then we'll bring Bo on. And we'll have an idea where you're going to be going. So, you know, we definitely are looking forward to having you on. As an analyst, today it was an opportunity to get you out there a little bit. And hopefully you'll have a lot of people. In, well, you have a lot of people in your corner anyways. So we're going to be paying attention to the draft to see where Corey Curtis does indeed go. So meanwhile, on behalf of Corey Curtis, George Eichhorn, and Mel Farr Jr. My name is Scott Morgan, Roth, the Motor City Madmouth. Thanking you for joining us on this edition of Inside the Pigskin. And we're going to have our self a really busy week 
talking about the National Football League. So, Corey, thanks again for being with us here tonight. George and Mel, as usual, are my thanks are always in line. And we are out. <laughs> <laughs>